Hi, everyone. Hello. Welcome back to another Planetarium live stream. Um, we've got a really fun one today that I think is going to be great. Um, Eli has been working on um, redoing our Star Wars show that we used to have, um, that we're going to hopefully premiere uh, not long after we're able to open back up. Um, and he's going to give us a little preview um, with some of the topics that are going to be in the show. Um, and so I am going to turn it over to Eli. Um, I will be checking the comments. Um, so if you have any questions throughout, um, type them in there. I will um, be looking and let Eli know. Um, <coughs> and any that we don't get to, we'll, we will have some time at the end. Um, to go over things. So uh, I will let Eli take it away. Awesome. Well, I'm going to share. Well, first, I'm going to turn off my video and then I'm going to share the screen. <clears throat> okay. Is that looking good, Jessica? Yeah. Okay, sweet. Um, so unfortunately, I couldn't figure out how to have an audio file um, playing behind a slide, or else I would have put a clip of the Star Wars music. Um, but We'll save that for the actually developed in-house show. Um, but this is Star Wars Factor Fiction. Um, and we're going to kind of take a look at some of the things that Star Wars got right and some of the things that Star Wars got wrong uh, about physics and astronomy. Um, there are a couple instances of both, um, but I think overall it's a good place to learn some lessons. And um, not only did I learn stuff about... Um, you know, Star Wars lore, um, which I enjoyed very much while making this, but I also was able to learn some stuff about uh, some cool physics things that would happen with like lasers and things like that. So first we will talk about um, binary systems. So this is probably one of the uh, most cinematic Star Wars scenes ever. This is the double sunset. Um, and the thing that always sticks out to me um, about this scene is the epic rising music in the background. Um, but the kind of cool hidden detail is we see this double sunset and it's really cool and it seems like something purely out of science fiction, but actually it's uh, quite realistic. Um, in fact, um, Tatooine is a uh, planet that orbits a binary star or binary system. Um, and these are just two stars that, as well as having planets orbit them, um, they also orbit each other. Um, and uh, these binary stars uh, exist pretty much everywhere that we can see. Um, and it could be that up to uh, even 85% of star systems um, could be binary. Um, and even more than binary star systems, we can have um, ternary or quaternary star systems. You could have these four stars or three stars orbiting each other. Um, so, you know, maybe some planets, well, we know for sure that some planets see double sunsets. Um, in fact, actually, the first planet uh, that orbits a binary star was discovered, um, I believe, late last year. Um, but uh, there could be planets out there that uh, see a triple or a quadruple uh, sunset, which would be um, pretty awesome to see, I think. Um, so next, we will go to habitable zones, kind of ties in to um, that last thing we were seeing. Um, so the habitable zone um, around stars, every star has a habitable zone, but um, a lot of them are different. Um, the habitable zone around stars is kind of the range of distance from the star um, where an Earth-like planet or, you know, a planet that could support life like Earth can uh, could exist. Um, and this just means that it has uh, temperatures sufficient to uh, support liquid water in a reasonable atmosphere. Um, but the atmosphere also depends on the size of the planet. It's not exactly or only distance. Um, so, uh, but the problem with this uh, habitable zone assumption is that uh, it assumes that whatever uh, planet we're talking about is going to host a uh, Earth-like life. Um, so, I mean, we have no basis to know what other life would look like out in the universe. We only know Earth life. Um, so when we make these guidelines or where we think life would be around a star, we assume that it's Earth life uh, because we really don't have anything to, uh, you know, justify any conjecture as to what other life would look like. Um, but we can kind of see this habitable zone um, 
concept illustrated in Star Wars um, with the different planets that we visit. Um, so in the red ring here, uh, this would be too hot. It's too close to the star. Um, I mean, you know, you're going to get too much uh, intense radiation uh, kind of scorch the surface, not uh, much life going on there. Um, right on the border, we would have a planet like Tatooine or in our solar system, which would be Venus. Um, now, Venus is uninhabitable for other reasons, um, but it's kind of in the spot right there. Um, it's just on the border. Um, and that would be Tatooine. We see that kind of desert planet, but they still are able to have, uh, you know, liquid farm, or I believe it's called moisture farms. Um, and, you know, it's where Luke and uh, Anakin and uh, Leia, well, not Leia, but Luke and Anakin grew up. Um, and then kind of right in the middle of the habitable zone, we'd have a planet like Endor, lush forests, um, you know, diverse wildlife, um, looks kind of like Earth. Um, and then on the edge, we'd have a planet like Hoth, uh, which is still habitable but bordering on too cold snow covered um, very icy and i think it's interesting that uh, we kind of see these concepts shine through in the star wars lore um so next this is a personal favorite of mine um a real life death star um, this one is pretty awesome um this is saturn's well one on the left um if you can distinguish between the two um is saturn's uh, innermost moon it's called mimus um and it actually looks like the Death Star from a distance. Um, this moon was discovered in 1789 by a famous astronomer and physicist, uh, William Herschel, but he didn't see it close enough to see this kind of uh, crater in it, which is actually now named Herschel after him. Um, but this crater, which was uh, discovered in 1980, which is three years after the first Star Wars film was released, um, is uh, very resemblant of the Death Star super laser. Um, the other really interesting thing about it that I didn't know was that Herschel, this crater, um, emits, uh, if we look at it in infrared or look for heat signatures or heat signals coming off of it, um, we see really, really intense heat, um, coming off of Herschel. Um, so, you know, maybe that's resemblant of the heat that would come out of a super laser. I thought that was, um, really interesting. Um, and that heat is just believed to be because, um, that crater was formed by some collision with uh, some space rock or another. And since it's closer to the core, if there is, um, you know, some type of convection or any heat generating process going on at the core, since it's closer, we would see more heat. Um, so next, looks like we're going to fly through this a little faster than I thought. Um, so blast weapons. This one uh, was really fun to do as well. Um, so. I thought, and I consider myself to be a big Star Wars fanatic. I think I know my lore, um, but I apparently I don't because um, I thought these blaster weapons were um, the the blasts or the the bolts were actually lasers, um, but that's actually uh, incorrect. Um, these blaster weapons fire um, bolts of plasma, um, which is converted into plasma from very energy uh, rich gas. Um, and it kind of sounds like the work of science fiction, uh, but it's actually totally, I mean, that's that's all good. Uh, there's nothing wrong with that. Um, plasma is kind of this fourth state of matter. It's, it's really hard for us to, you know, manipulate and work with because it's not really made of atoms. It's made from um, these charged particles that, you know, have dissociated from atoms, like electrons that have evaporated off of atoms. Um, and they're kind of like fleet, freely flowing. And uh, these, uh, bolts that we see here, these blaster bolts, um, would be described as what's called a plasmoid, um, which is kind of a, a glob of plasma. Now, um, getting plasma to kind of like isolate itself into a distinct shape um, would be difficult because these electrons flow freely like a kind of like a gas. They would just kind of spread out and disperse. Um, but in, uh, in reading some articles about the uh, validity of these topics, um, I learned that they, uh, the plasmoids uh, can be kind of held in shape by um, electrical and magnetic fields. Um, now, the problem I imagined at this point was, you know, how are you going to get a continuous magnetic field to keep it in that shape as it travels or as it, you know, fires out? Um, but this is also possible, um, as it turns out. Um, these fields that keep this shape um, can be generated um, by shaping the bolt in a certain way. So rather than these bolts just kind of being a solid cylinder, they would be um, like hollow in the middle. And then charge would move through this uh, or these electrons and it would actually continuously generate a magnetic field as it went forward, which would keep the blaster in its shape. And, and this uh, 
this kind of orientation of plasma is called a spheromac, I believe is the pronunciation. Um, so these, these things only hold their shape for, you know, 10 to uh, hundreds of microseconds. Um, but that's actually plenty of time uh, for you know, the plasma bolt to travel. Um, and uh, as it turns out, this is, you know, well, it hasn't been done yet. This is completely plausible. There's, there's, there's nothing wrong with this. And it, it kind of has already been done, uh, but nothing that is really, you know, worthy to write home about. Uh, there's nothing really solid, but we have seen it happen um, experimentally. Um, this plasma would kind of reach temperatures uh, hotter than the surface of the sun. So they would also be really good at damaging whatever you shot them at. Um, and, you know, like I said, well, the uh, Star Wars blaster technology is definitely out of reach right now. Um, we could see something um, that gives the same effect uh, in the future. Probably would be very hard to confine it into a blaster you can hold in your hand. Um, but I... Uh, I'm hopeful to see what happens and also not because that would be a pretty dangerous weapon to have, but it'd be pretty cool to see. All right, so now we'll go on to another one that was really fun to work on. Um, and this is the uh, physics of space flight. Um, so in Star Wars, um, we don't see much difference between um, flying in space and flying around a planet with an atmosphere around you. Um, but in fact, these, these, um, two different processes couldn't be more different. Um, so on the left, we have this force diagram of what happens to a plane that is in the atmosphere. And we always see in movies, or you know, if you're fond of aviation, that in order for a plane to turn, it actually, it doesn't actually turn like a car would on a street, but it tilts. Um, and that's because um, when you tilt, um, the gravity pulling you down and the lift force pushing you up will combine to create a force going to the side and you'll actually start going in a circular path. You'll start spinning in circles if you held it right. Um, and that's called a banked turn. And we see this in Star Wars and we see it around planets, which is good, that makes sense. But we also see it in space, which doesn't make sense um, because in space, there is no um, lift force pushing you up. So there would be no force to combine. Um, and, uh, you know, like we see here on these, this NASA diagram, we have the drag um, pulling you back, we have the thrust pushing you forward, we have the lift, and then we have the weight. Um, in space, really the only thing you would have would be the thrust, um, unless you were near some planet or something that would pull you down. So uh, space flight would actually have to be entirely different um, in Star Wars than it is right now. And what it would have to be is um, rather than having uh, you know one booster in the back right here, so this is pretty poor image quality, um, one booster in the back right there, you would need to have rockets on every side of your ship. So you'd need to have one on the top, one on the back, um, one on the front if you wanted to go in reverse, which would be pretty cool with the spaceship, I think. And then um, one on each side and one on the bottom. Um, and in order for your spaceship to turn, um, you would have to combine two thrusters. So um, for example, if you wanted to turn in the direction of the green arrow, you'd have to light your back thruster so it pushed you forward and you'd have to uh, light your uh, right thruster so it pushed you to the left and the resultant motion, the combination of those two would be um, the direction of the green arrow. Um, but we don't see this in Star Wars. Um, in fact, most of the ships we see have one booster in the back and if we were, uh, actually flying that spaceship, that would mean we could move in one direction only, um, which uh, would be pretty inconvenient in space, especially when dodging asteroid fields or things like that. Um, and speaking of asteroid fields, that's the next thing I want to talk about. Oh, no, that's in one more slide, actually, rather. Um, the other thing about Star Wars that um, always grabbed my attention, it's not necessarily like wrong or anything, but I think it's pretty interesting, is when we see these huge epic um, spaceship battles, all of the spaceships are oriented in the same direction. Like they're all face, you know, or, you know, up is the same direction for, it's so, it's so weird to talk about because there's no like up in space, but um, the top of the ships are all facing the same direction. And uh, realistically, that's probably not how it would be um, because there is no, you know, universal compass in space. There is no set up or down. Um, Rather, they would probably all be oriented in different directions because, you know, the planets that they launched from or however they moved as they were traveling would have been far different 
um, and you know the plans would have been tilted differently. So um, I th I think personally, if we were to see something like this, we would see all these ships kind of tilted in different directions, and I think it would be very discombobulated. So it makes sense that they uh, oriented it the way they did. But that's something that always grabbed my attention. So now we'll talk about the asteroid fields. Um, so as exhilarating as these uh, asteroid field scenes are from Star Wars where they're bobbing and weaving throughout, um, they're not entirely realistic uh, because these asteroids are all uh, actually incredibly far apart from each other. Um, so flying through an asteroid field, um, you know, for example, the solar system's asteroid belt um, would be actually almost no different than flying through regular space um, or empty space rather. Um, we've sent a lot of space probes out through the asteroid belt and um, never once has there really been any danger of um, encountering one or colliding with one. And actually um, only, I believe it's four of the many, many more that we've sent out have actually even imaged one. So they haven't even really come in contact. And uh, it's estimated that a probe flying through the asteroid belt um, has a one in a billion chance of colliding with something. Um, so obviously we see much more apparent danger here in the Star Wars asteroid fields. Um, and it definitely makes for kind of blood pumping scenes, but uh, it would actually probably be much easier for Han and Chewie to uh, navigate those asteroid fields in reality. All right, um, the next thing I wanna talk about is probably one of the uh, noises in Star Wars that sticks out the most to me. Um, and that is, um, Django and uh, Boba Fett's, uh, their spaceship Slave One's um, seismic charge that they set off. Um, so as uh, Obi-Wan Kenobi is making his way to Geonosis in um, the uh, Attack of the Clones, they try to stop him and they uh, use what's uh, what they call a seismic charge. Um, and as we see here in this kind of mesmerizing gif, um, it is this big energy explosion that sends this wave out. Um, and if you remember the sound, the sound is very like bass, heavy, it's, it's a really weird sound. I don't know how to describe it. Um, and the problem with the seismic charge is that um, we see two waves happen as a result of it. Um, we see the seismic wave, um, as we consume it as this kind of energy wave going outwards that breaks the rocks and stuff. Um, and then we also hear, when you can hear the movie, this um, really intense sound wave. Um, and the problem with this is that in space, there isn't a medium for these waves to travel through. Um, actually, that's kind of what characterizes space. It, it is mediumless. There's nothing for waves to travel through. That's why we always hear the classic no sound in space fact. Um, but as well as no sound in space, there is no seismic waves travel through like the Earth's crust or something um, when an earthquake happens. And there, again, there's no medium. So these seismic charges would um, actually do very little to nothing in space. So we would be better off. A projectile trying to hit the ship. Um, but again, the sound is really cool um, and it's a really awesome idea. Um, I feel like to protect my hide, I need to say that Star Wars is one of my favorite movie franchises and I'm not trying to uh, devalidate the movies at all, but just uh, kind of learn some lessons from it. Um, so the next thing we're going to talk about is space travel, because um, I also think that this is really interesting. Um, we also have a really cool diagram of the uh, Star Wars galaxy that's far, far away right here. Um, I believe the website is uh, starwarsgalaxy.net, but I could be wrong. Just look up Star Wars galaxy map, um, and it actually gives you like a really coherent map of where all the planets are. It's, it's actually really cool. I really like it. Um, but uh, the space travel in Star Wars is really interesting because... In the movies, we always see, you know, somebody get in their ship and leave. And then in another scene, a few scenes later, we see them arrive on some planet, but they don't really elaborate on how much time was spent um, in that travel period. Um, in, in the Clone Wars, they do a little bit, so you get to learn a little more about distances. Um, but in the movies alone, um, they don't elaborate on it much. Um, and uh, the fact is that traveling through or traveling between these planets would be a uh, be a pretty slow process. Um, so obviously they have hyperspeed in Star Wars, which we'll talk about in the next slide. Um, but for now, let's kind of like rationalize it with the fastest thing that man has created, which is the Parker um, solar probe, which is on the left there. Um, that is, it broke the world record um, for fastest man-made object by going 153,454 miles per hour, which is insane. Um, and kind of mind-boggling that something was going that fast. Um, 
But even traveling at that speed, getting from Earth to Mars would take about 40 days. So, and that's just two planets in the same system that are right next to each other. Um, if we wanted to go from one planet to another at the other side of the galaxy, um, and the best example I can find was traveling from Tatooine, which is down here. I don't know if you can see my cursor. It's kind of in the uh, bottom right of the galaxy to Ilum, which is kind of top left. Um, obviously, we know Tatooine. Um, Ilum is a planet that uh, youngling Jedis would perform some trials at and then find the crystal to power their lightsaber They're called Kyber crystals. Um, making that journey, going across that galaxy in the Parker uh, solar probe would take 462 billion years, which is about 33 times the age of the universe. So even in the fastest man-made object, it would still take that long. So we had to rely on hyperspace and hyperspeed for Star Wars. Um, we'll real quick, about. before we jump into that, we had a question that I think is going to relate oh, yeah. to this a little. Um, yeah. Jenny Conrad asked, how would astronauts fly in space and have a sense of direction if we don't use the same sense of direction as we do here on Earth? We are elementary that's students a, watching from home. Yeah, that's a really good question. And the answer is that they really wouldn't. Um, so once you kind of get into space, I mean, our down is characterized by the gravity that's pulling us down um, to the center of Earth. That's kind of really our one bearing for direction. Um, once you leave that gravitational influence and you don't have anything kind of orienting you, there really is no sense of direction or up and down. Um, so like, you know, flying your ship, like I said, there wouldn't be any proper orientation to fly your ship at. Um, so there, there really isn't, you know, like inner space highways would be really confusing to look at um, because all of these ships and, you know, everything would be oriented completely differently. Um, so I think really the only sense of direction you have in space travel is getting where you're going. So like, you know, the astronauts going to the moon, um, really their only direction that they are thinking of, their only dimension that they're worried about is the line between them and the moon. Um, other than that, there's no like proper orientation up and down. Anything but like that. I, I will jump in and say that what, um, they would use would be a map of the stars. Mm. Um, because you would need to have kind of a 3D map of the stars and the galaxy. And with that, you could tr figure out where you are. Right. Yeah. So it would yeah. be kind of like how we use landmarks and street signs here on Earth. It would just be with stars and things in the galaxy. Right. Yeah. It sounds, actually, if I can be honest, it sounds kind of horrible. I don't think I would do too hot in space. Um, I think I'd probably get pretty dizzy pretty quick. Um, so, um, but yeah, it would be very confusing and maps would probably look a lot more intricate, um, than they do, um, or, you know, much more different from the map in the center console of your car or, or on your GPS or whatever. Um, so, but I think it'd be cool to see, but again, very discombobulating. Um, so, okay, uh, now we'll talk about hyperspace and hyperspeed, which is kind of a really cool plot device used in Star Wars to um, eliminate that, you know, 400 billion year travel time that we were talking about. So um, in Star Wars, when the ships need to travel these great distances, they enter hyperspace. Um, and it's just, it's, they say it's like another dimension that you can enter. Um, and it just like decreases travel time between point A and B. and um, it, that kind of, I, I don't know enough lore on that to speak about the science, um, but I do know that um, in order to, uh, in order to get to hyperspeed or hyperspace, you need to travel the speed of light. And uh, this is kind of a, an interesting topic in and of itself. Um, so getting to speed of light would be an extreme problem. Um, so as an object, as its speed increases, um, it takes more and more energy to accelerate it to greater speeds. Um, and once the speed of this object starts getting to, you know, speeds like tens of percents of the speed of light, the energy required to accelerate it further um, becomes like virtually impossible. And once you get really close to the speed of light, it actually just becomes like it's impossible. You can't do it. Um, or at least we definitely couldn't right now. Um, and uh, because of that, it would be, you know, it would be improbable that we could accelerate something um, to that speed. Um, the other thing I thought was interesting that somebody else brought up from the planetarium brought up to me is that um, 
in Star Wars, we always see these ships jump to speed like really quickly, um, you know, like snap and they're at light speed. But the problem with that is that if you accelerated that fast, the inertia of you, the ship moving forward, but you staying where you are would probably kill you. Um, so that's why like in Star Trek, we have um, the uh, inertial dampeners um, to kind of like ease that transition. So you'd actually need to like gradually increase your speed very, very slowly. And, and to, to the speeds that you're traveling. give a real life example, that's like when you're in the car and you suddenly hit the gas pedal and the car yeah. moves forward and you kind of feel like you've been jarred backwards or, yeah. or versus very gradually pushing the gas pedal. It's that sort of thing, but even more extreme. Right. Like that's like five miles per hour they're increasing and this is, you know like 90 million miles per hour. So it would be pretty intense. So you'd need to gradually ease into that speed. Um, and then now probably one of the most famous things from Star Wars is the uh, the Kessel Run. The Millennium Falcon made the Kessel Run in 12 parsecs, whole thing that everybody argues about. So everybody thought that this was a wrong, it was, it was just misinformation. They used the wrong units. That would be like saying, I made the Kessel Run in 12 parsecs would be like saying, I drove from Minneapolis to Los Angeles in 18 miles. Like it doesn't really make sense. Um, it's a, using a distance to travel a distance, um, but it actually is within the lore. It's really valid. Um, so the Kessel Run, as we see here, is this kind of region of space um, where you need to bob and weave through a bunch of like plastic and uh, carbon materials and waste, um, and then get out um, from Kessel, which is at the center, to uh, Obadiah, which is a planet outside. Um, but what Han Solo was saying was rather than bobbing and weaving throughout the stuff and dodging um, that gray oval, which is uh, kind of a field of black holes, um, his ship was fast enough that he could drive straight through that field of, of black holes and bob and weave throughout them without being pulled in by the gravity too hard um, and cut the trip way, 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 way shorter. Um, so the uh, orange area you see there is the trip that the Millennium Falcon took where he Bob and weave throughout these uh, black holes and was able to dodge all of this material and make it out really quickly. Whereas um, a less powerful ship or a less fast ship would uh, have to take that blue route, which is kind of the safe um, kind of maze route. So um, that's also something that was really interesting. I learned a lot about the lore um, from that. Um, but yeah, I thought that one was really cool as well. Um, so now we're gonna kind of talk about the last thing. Um, which is lightsabers. Um, and this was, I was really excited for this one as well um, because this is always really interesting to me and I secretly really want, not even secretly, I just really want a lightsaber. Um, but uh, unfortunately, I don't think it's going to happen anytime soon. Um, so these are like the coolest things about Star Wars to me, the noises they make, how they look. It's, it's so awesome to me. And I always, my heart races when there's a, a lightsaber battle. Uh, and also I watched the Anakin Obi-Wan battle probably weekly on YouTube. But um, so lightsabers themselves um, would be kind of hard to work with. Um, so the name implies again, that it's gonna be light that's traveling throughout the blade. Um, but again, um, I was wrong. Um, According to Star Wars lore, it's plasma again. Um, so it's like those blaster bolts. Um, but the problem with the lightsabers now is um, the blaster bolts don't travel out continuously, or the light the lightsaber blades don't travel out continuously like the blaster bolts did. Um, they, they end at a certain point. And this would mean that we would need to have either some type of cap at the end, um, which kind of defeats the point of the lightsaber because then um, you can't stab anything with it. And if it's a mirror, it just reflects the plasma back or, you know, whatever's in the blade back at the hilt, which would probably ruin it. Um, so uh, it kind of makes it really impractical or you'd have to generate some kind of field. And um, that would also be extremely difficult. Um, so the other solution would be having an infinitely long blade, which also doesn't sound very practical for battle. Um, and the other problems with lightsabers is that you would need to cool the handle so that it didn't burn your hands. Um, and uh, the energy required to heat up that plasma, again, is completely improbable and um, impossible to fit inside of that lightsaber hilt. So um, lightsabers, as we see them in Star Wars, um, probably won't happen anytime soon, um, although I, I hope and hope and hope that they will, um, even though I probably shouldn't be trusted with one. 
Um, and and uh, the one other problem actually that I was thinking about with the lightsabers is light or plasma are extremely light. Well, light actually has no weight. Um, plasma is extremely light. Um, and so the, the, the weight balance in the blade would be way off. It would be all in the handle rather than bounce throughout the whole blade like a sword. So combat would be really weird. And then um, the other problem is that your blades wouldn't clash into each other and make the cool sound like they do in Star Wars. They'd actually just pass right through each other. Um, so I don't know. It just kind of, it takes the fun away, but I don't want to end on a negative note. So I did a little research and I found that there is a company that creates lightsabers. Um, and obviously they're not lightsabers, lightsabers as we think of them in Star Wars, um, but they're pretty cool nonetheless. Um, this is uh, Wicked Lasers, um, the laser saber. So obviously they were trying to avoid a copyright strike with that name, but um, I would just call the lightsaber. Um, and there are these, these hilts with a extremely, like almost illegally powerful laser inside, but they are legal. Um, and uh, then there's this kind of like poly, polycarbonate blade or, you know, like casing where the blade would be. And um, they actually do truly look a lot like lightsabers because they power up and the blade rises rather than just instantly appearing. Um, and uh, they are extremely cool. Um, I have it bookmarked on my computer just in case I happen upon $400 in the street one day. Um, but unfortunately, again, it wouldn't be a one-to-one -one replacement for a lightsaber. Um, you have to be really careful with them. These lasers are extremely powerful. Um, you couldn't actually like battle with them because if the if the sheath were to or you know the, the shield were to break, um, that laser could like definitely injure someone. So you'd have to be really really careful with it. Um, and uh, you'd have you have to wear this like protective eye gear. Um, and they're these like really lame looking sunglasses that don't wouldn't make me feel like a Jedi personally. So it would kind of take some of the effect away. Um, so ultimately for now, um, the laser saber will have to do if you're a, a real diehard, um, but fingers crossed that we can get some one-to-one -one, uh, analogy for a lightsaber in the future. Um, and with that, that is the end of the slideshow. So I went a little over time. Um, good. Um, so, so we do have yeah. another question. Uh, yeah. from Noah Woodruff. Uh, how logical oh, is the tractor beam? Um, hi, Noah. Um, that's my little brother. Uh, the tractor beam. <laughs> um, I don't, I don't know how you would pull that off. I maybe like really, really heavy magnets, I suppose, because those ships have to be made of something magnetic. Um, so you could have like a really, really, really powerful magnet, but I don't, we don't have anything at our disposal right now that could do that. Um, so not very right now, but I guess it wouldn't be impossible. It's a really heavy magnet. Yeah. Um, uh, so if anyone has any other questions, um, put them in the comments and we will check on that. Um, while we are waiting a few minutes to see if there are any other questions. Um, first off, awesome job to Eli. Um, like we said, this is, um, a show that we are working on kind of redoing. Um, we used to have a show called um, Astronomy Lessons from Star Wars that is just out of date at this point. Um, and so Eli and some of the other students have been working on um, re revamping it. Uh, and that will hopefully be out not long after we're able to open up again. Just you know, watch Facebook, we'll let you know. Yep. Um, and it'll have, you know, all the cool planetary and visuals with it. Yeah. Um, and then coming up next week, we have on Wednesday, we're doing another segment of Ask an Astronomer. And so we'll tell you some of the cool things that have happened in the past few weeks and answer any questions that you have. And then on Saturday, we are doing um, a show on exoplanets, planets around other stars. And I'm going to talk about um, kind of how we find them, uh, what we found, and also touch on some of the really weird planets we found, because uh, there are a lot of weird ones out there. Um, so yeah, I guess the only other piece of news is um, we still do not know when we're going to be able to open the planetarium back up. 
Obviously, we want to stay closed and keep our community safe and healthy for as long as needed. Um, I know UMD is currently um, staying closed through the end of spring semester. So at the very least, we will be closed through mid-May, um, but that may continue throughout the summer. But we will post updates um, whenever we find out any new information um, on our website and social media pages. Um, but in the meantime, we will keep doing these live streams so that we can keep connecting with you guys. Um, we've got a few other shows that we have been working on um, that are going to come out once we can open back up um, that we're thinking about doing something similar um, to what we just did with Star Wars and kind of previewing it for you. Um, one of the shows we've been working on is about uh, astronomy that can be found in the Harry Potter universe, which I'm really excited for. Um, we've also been working on a brand new Aurora show, um, which is going to be fantastic. Um, a show on aliens and where we could possibly find life in the universe. Um, so there's a lot of cool things that we're working on. And we think um, this could be a good way of kind of giving you guys some previews and also helping us work out um, the show. Um, but if you have any topics that you would like to see in these live streams, please let us know. Um, because we're, we're definitely looking for things to talk about with you guys um, and share with you. And we want to do shows that you're interested in. Um, so with that... It uh, doesn't look like we have any more questions. So um, I guess we'll uh, say goodbye for now. As usual, any of our live streams can be found on our YouTube page. Um, and yeah, we hope everyone enjoyed the show and has a great weekend. It seems to be a really pretty day out there. Yeah. Um, so th all, right. all right. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Bye.